In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is in our midst. This is a Sunday after the Feast of the Elevation of the Cross, so we're continuing to celebrate the Feast of the Precious and Life-Giving Cross. The Cross of the Lord is at the heart of the Christian faith. It is at the center of everything we do in the Church. And by that I mean it is at the center of your life, or it should be. As you may know, the Church dedicates two weeks in September to celebrate the, the elevation of the Holy Cross, starting with the Sunday before the Feast, then the day of the Feast, which falls on September 14th, and then the Sunday after the Feast, which is today. And there are prescribed Epistle and Gospel lessons for each of these days and for the days in between including the ones that you just heard. We will try to take a brief walk through, maybe I shouldn't say that, maybe a slice of the readings that are prescribed for the feast, for the Sunday before the feast and the Sunday after the feast. I printed those and made them available for you. We can't go over them thoroughly, but there's some, something that we can take out of them today. Take them home and read them. That's a good way to celebrate the feast. In the epistle of the Holy Apostle Paul, one of the main things we observe is how central the cross is in the Gospel. This message of the cross was just as hard to hear when St. Paul was writing, as it is today. To the Corinthians, he writes that the cross is a stumbling block to Jews and a folly or foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And so there's a question in there for us. Do we understand the word of the cross to be the power of God and the wisdom of God? Or is it a stumbling block or foolishness? I'm not sure which of the two is worse, but we can be sure of what St. Paul is preaching. He's preaching Christ crucified, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And he's not preaching to a crowd that is ready to receive his writings calmly. He's writing to the church in Corinth that's been very much divided. The division in Corinth had many layers. Not that we could get into that. But St. Paul preaches Christ crucified as the source of their unity. In Corinth, there were Jewish Christians who once believed that everyone who hangs on a tree is cursed. That's a reference going back all the way to Deuteronomy. And there are also Gentiles who saw the cross to be a sign of weakness. St. Paul is saying the cross is not a curse. It is a sign that defeated the ancient curse, and it's a sign of victory and triumph, and that's why it is not weakness, but the power and wisdom of God. Next in this letter to the Galatians, St. Paul is also dealing with a church among split and division, brought about by those who are harassing Christians and harassing St. Paul himself about circumcision. So he writes, Far be it from me to glory or to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but a new creation. The cure for division in the eyes of St. Paul is a new creation focused on the cross without distraction. 
and not just the cross as something that is external to us, but something deeply personal. So when we look on the cross, we don't just see that Christ has been crucified, and of course He has, but we see ourselves crucified with Him, not instead of Him, but with Him. The cross needs to become our own. By the cross, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Only when we are in the new creation can we say with St. Paul, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, as from this morning's epistle. This is not St. Paul using some nice poetic language. This is as direct as he can be. St. Paul is dead. Not half dead, dead. Christians who read his letter throughout the ages didn't think of themselves as partially dying. They were dead to the world. This is radical. And I don't know how to make this sound softer. The Gospel of Christ is not soft. This dying to the world is not only for Christians who suffered persecutions of some time past. It is for every Christian today. But the Gospel is not only about death. It is about life. In case you didn't pick it up, Here's what St. Paul was saying. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Because St. Paul died, now he lives. Because St. Paul died, now he lives. Why does he live? Because Christ loved him and gave his life for him. So now, St. Paul knows, only knows how to live in this love. And so like St. Paul, if we want to acquire Christ's life, we need to die. To be crucified to the world and the world to us. This means that our passions need to die that our heart can no longer be given to them. We don't die partially. We simply die to receive His life. Which means that we don't give up the passion partially. We don't crucify our will partially. We die fully so that Christ may live in us and His love may be manifest in us. So that's the epistles. We have the power of God, the wisdom of God, and the love of God all on display on the cross. And then we come to the Gospels and we read, God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That was last Sunday's Gospel. God's soul of the world means both. That's how much and the way in which God loved the world. So if we want to acquire God's love, we need to pay attention. There it is. It is not the love that demands, but a love that gives. Doesn't ask what can I receive. It asks what can I give? What can I do? How can I serve my brother, my sister, my wife, my children, my family, my church, and my neighbor? We see all of this on display when Christ ascends the cross. And the long gospel we read two days ago takes us right back to Holy Week, to Holy and Great.
Great Friday. We stand at the foot of the cross and behold the Lord embracing the cross willingly with all the pain that it involved amidst the rejection by his own creature, showing his love that had no limits, the love that poured out of his side when one of the soldiers pierced his side and at once came out blood and water. Blood and water poured out of his side to water the whole of creation. And it continues to be poured out for you and for many at the divine liberty. Now, allow me to bring you in with me into the priesthood. Before the liturgy starts, the priest comes to pray a service of the proskomiti or the preparation of the holy gifts for the liturgy. He takes out the lamb out of the proskoda, the bread that you prepare and you bring to the church. After he takes out the lamb, the priest takes a spear and pierces the lamb. And he prays his verse. And one of the soldiers pierced his side, and at once came forth blood and water. And he who saw it has borne witness, and his witness is true. And then he pours wine and water into the chalice. This is the sacrificial love of God that was poured out over creation and into the cup that you receive in your body. Let this cup wash you and purify your heart as you participate in Christ's sacrifice because this will feed your life. You participate in Christ's sacrifice here so you may be crucified with Him when you leave when you step out the doors of the church. And you renew that cross in your life every time you pray, every time you read the scriptures, every time you fast, every time you repent, every time you put down your ego in order to serve your neighbor, you participate in that sacrifice. In today's Gospel, from St. Mark's Gospel, we hear these precious words, <clears throat> if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In St. Luke's account of the same time when the Lord was speaking to the disciples, he said, the Lord says, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Your pride is shed away. You are 
being crucified with Christ. And Christ begins to live in you. And so humility starts to take root. Your patience begins to grow. Your love starts to mature. Christ's virtues become more visible in your heart because it is no longer you who live, but Christ who lives in you. To Him be glory, honor,